Welcome to Car Pervert, I'm Johnny Smith and this is my review of the Mini Electric. The place that I've just left there is the Mini Cowley factory here in Oxfordshire. And the Mini was born here, the Mini's been built here since 1959 and it's still going to be made there. In fact, this car, the Mini E, the, the electric version, is being made there right now. They've just started production of the electric Mini and I've got the chance to drive it. I'm a first drive of it on home soil in the Oxfordshire countryside where it was born and bred. And yes, Mini is now owned by the BMW Group, but that's the way that the best British companies seem to be thriving. Managed and owned by foreign money, engineered, developed in, the, in Britain. I think that's a good combo. And the Mini is, the biggest market for the Mini is actually the home market, um, the UK. We love Minis. We absolutely love Minis. It's hard to believe that nearly 20 years ago, it got rebooted as the Mini 1 um, by BMW, 20 years ago. Fast forward to now, 2020, and we finally got the first mass-produced electric Mini. They make a new Mini every 67 seconds. This is being made alongside piston cars. So depending on world trends, depending on demand, they can ramp up production of the electric or, or they can back it off. It's the cost-efficient way of making new cars, the same way that Peugeot are doing it with the, the 208, the piston ones alongside the electrics. There's already been 100,000 global pre-orders for this, the Mini Electric, so it's been a long time coming, especially given that 10 years ago, or a bit more than 10 years ago, they did an electric prototype of about 600 cars in the previous shaped Mini 1, but never mind, this is it now. This is it. It's available, weirdly, in a three-door only, which is, I think, the only car in its class that's three-door only. Most cars now are five-door only, but I kind of like three-door. It's more impractical, but it looks better. And actually, on the face of it, it's the same as a Mini Cooper S. It's actually priced less than the Mini Cooper S piston car, but it's aesthetically almost the same, and I'll have a look around it in a second. So what is it? Well, it's front-wheel drive, because all Minis are front-wheel drive. 136 kilowatt uh, motor taken from the BMW i3 because remember BMW owns Mini and that's under there with revised ancillaries in this sort of special cradle and then it's 32.6 kilowatt hour battery pack arranged in a T position and the battery cells the modules 12 modules 96 cells they live down this central spine and underneath the, those back seats the back seats are the same height as the original mini back seats. They're not big, but they're fine for children. You're not gonna buy this car if you want massive amounts of interior packaging. The ride height is a little bit higher, 20 mil higher than the normal Mini Cooper S, and that's because that belly, all those batteries in the belly, make the car a little bit more vulnerable. But they've hidden it by making these wheel arches just a little bit deeper to disguise that. And with these 17 inch wheels, you can't really tell unless I've just told you. So let's talk about design. Well, if you're familiar with a Mini, it's all very familiar. And Mini have kind of made that clear. They want people to buy a Mini and it just kind of happens to be electric. In the same way that VW have got the Golf with the E-Golf, it's the same but kind of different, and the E-Up, and, and actually the Peugeot 208. And I guess this proves that if you want to shout about being EV, you can. But if you want to just blend into the background and the rest of the commuter traffic here in Oxfordshire, you can. This is a Mini, it just happens to be powered by electricity. The Mini 1 kind of shape, classic three-door hatch, which I do love. I, I think it's probably the best looking Mini when it's simple, poised, looks really good. Two-tone as standard, you pick a white or a black roof. You've got the E logo here in the filler door, because remember, this is a body shelf, same as the piston cars. It shares so much componentry just to make it easier and cheaper. And also people love the Mini, so why change it? This particular car that I'm testing today has actually got a lot of delete options from the Mini E. It should have yellow mirror cappings. It should have uh, wheels called the electric Corona wheels, which are styled um, on a three pin British plug, which I quite like. They're, they're asymmetric, they're a bit funky and they're a bit more aero. The, this car, this particular car, has got the more conventional 17-inch wheels. Then you go to the front, 
The first thing you're going to notice about the Mini Electric is the fact that it's got a filled-in grill. This should be a normal static grill for a piston car. It isn't now. It's got a very thin air intake there, yellow electric or E badges, and that's on the front and on the sides and on the back. That there is filled in, that grill there, and that's about it at the front. Rear spoiler, because it's Mini Cooper S spec, which is why it says Cooper S, it just happens to see, say E over here. And a little three on the back, well, that's because there's three levels of trim for this car. The entry level is the 24,400. Then you've got the mid-level, number two, which comes with heated seats and some of the safety features. And then this one is the range topper, which has panoramic roof, head-up display, and a glorious Harman Kardon audio. Look, it's a boot with real bags in and real stuff. If you've ever bought a Mini, you'll know you don't buy a Mini because of its boot space, but weirdly, it's not the smallest in class. And there's a false floor under here to keep your three pin um, emergency charger and your extra cables. They live underneath here. I'll just do this in a really glamorous way. I actually can't do it. No, I'm gonna have to take this out. I'm not, I can't be bothered. Cut to B-roll, cut to B-roll. So yeah, there you go, there's the boot space, all 230 litres of it. It's not the smallest amongst its uh, rivals, the Honda E is, um, but it's second from bottom. Yeah, Zoe's got a far bigger boot. E208 Peugeot, far bigger boot. VW Up, far bigger boot. Oh, and before I forget, these. The new design Mini, the current Mini, has these very cool Union Jack rear lights. It's a good design feature. And the rear bumper here, because Coopers have normally got like a pair of shotgun exhausts, of course, because this is the electric Mini, no exhaust, a slightly revised rear bumper, but again, it's subtle, you wouldn't notice it. Hello electric Mini, or Mini E, I just want to still call it a Min E. The thing about Minis is, they're darty, they're direct. They're really sharp little cars. And, oh, that was a humpback bridge. They're fun. And within a couple of miles of getting in the, the Mini E, you realize that on the one hand, it's an electric car, and what you should probably do is drive it as efficiently as possible to get the most out of it in terms of range. And on the other hand, you're thinking, it's got a Cooper S boot badge. This thing's built to rail corners. It's got a really, really good chassis. And although the ride height's higher, it still feels really, really eager. Because of the electric motor being lighter than the engine at the front, it's now got 50-50 weight distribution. Perfect 50-50 weight distribution, which for car nutters, that's apparently, you know, the dream ticket. Well, this is a town. This is where a lot of Minis live. The Mini was always developed as an urban car back in 59, and it still is a very popular car. I mean, there's tons of them in London, there's tons of them when you go to other European cities. But the thing is, obviously, you can, you can still use it for the open road, for normal commuting, and it loves back roads. I've got to find some decent back roads because that's where the Mini really comes alive. The Mini's always been an exhilarating drive. It's always been very communicative, great chassis, good road holding, kind of cheeky, chirpy. Okay, range, WLTP range, which is your sort of real world measured range. Right at the bottom, yet the most expensive car, the Honda E. If you haven't seen my video of the Honda E, have a look at it, because uh, it's a great, beautiful piece of design, but it's expensive and it kind of is the worst on paper in almost every respect, but it's still a funky little beast. So that's way down below when it comes to range, 137 miles at best. Right at the top, almost the cheapest car, the Zoe ZE50 with a 52 kilowatt hour battery pack, 245 miles, incredible. Just behind it, the E208, and again in the middle is this, the Mini E. You've got the E up, which is 162 miles, this 144 miles. So yeah, there's a bit of a difference, and it depends what your preference is. Do you go for performance or do you go for range? In fact, let's talk performance, because the quickest car is this, the Mini E. This feels more playful than, well, it's a tighter, more athletic car than the Renault Zoe. That's the probably see, it's a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde car. 
because normally you get in an EV and you try to drive it as efficiently as possible to maximise your range. And the range on this isn't brilliant, but the way it drives is so addictive, you just want to keep pressing on and going hard into the corners and, and, and diving down the back lanes, because that's what a Mini is good for. It's kind of strange, really. I'm going to give it a quick punch. So no, not Tesla quick, but 7.3 to 62. Quicker than all its rivals on the sprint. Nothing can touch it. Look at the board. The board doesn't lie. The slowest by quite a long way is the VW E-Up slash Skoda City Go slash Seat Me. And that, the way it is coping with the terrible pothole roads that I've found. Great roads, but bad surface. And I think it's very quiet, actually. You get the impression you can really drive it flat out. Do you know what? As I'm razzing around the back lanes here, I'm thinking this would be an awesome car to take on a track day, just out of curiosity, just to feel that balance pushed to the limit. And the, th the throttle response and that eagerness that the, the Cooper S gives you is, is addictive. Brake pedal's firm, steering, like I said before, is quite, it's harder than an e-Golf, which was the last car I drove, and the throttle is stiffer than an e-Golf. But the damping and everything's just sweet. So I've got it on the most aggressive regen braking mode, which means when I come off the accelerator, it bites, the brakes bite instantly. But that's good, because if you're pressing on on the back roads, you can largely drive it on one pedal. Top speed 93 miles now. No EVs have got very high top speed. It's almost about the immediacy of the acceleration and stuff rather than top end. So 181 horsepower from the 136 kilowatt electric motor, 199 pounds feet of torque, and it feels punchy. In fact, it feels way punchier than, than pretty much all of the other cars in this class. This is more sporty this is this has been calibrated to the sportier end of the market so if you like a kind of nippy cheeky tight pointy nippy grr, it's this because as you can tell this has got bite and that's why I quite fancy taking it on the track now you've got different driving modes down here you've got kind of normal mode or you can put it in sport or you can put it in green or green plus and from what I can tell is that uh, optimises the air conditioning and the heating uh, and it dumbs down the throttle position if you're trying to get more efficiency and brings down the top speed. Or you go into sport mode and everything goes a bit red and aggressive, look. You see that? That goes, that goes properly red to say, oh, you want to play, do you? You want to play? Oh, I see. I can feel the throttle's immediately more present. I have to say, I really like this. I like its pleasant familiarity, it's still very mini. And this three-door Mini Cooper is, is probably the best of the Minis because it's still quite a small car. It's the smallest car bar one amongst its rivals that I've pitched it up against. Let's talk length. How long is the Mini E? Well, it's that long, which means it's shorter than all of its rivals. Apart from that one, it's definitely not shorter than that one. Other thing about a Mini is, for a modern car, you're really close to the, or it feels that you're really close to the, 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 the windscreen. So it, it kind of has the proportions of, a, of an older car. At low speed, you've got that mandatory sound, which I think does sound a bit odd. It's actually a bit loud on the inside, I think. It's probably the loudest part of the inside. We've just gone flying around the back lanes, really enjoying that. The damping and the suspension, I have to say, the, the quietness, the acoustics in the cabin, even with a glass roof, is amazing. It's quite nice to think that it's made in England and it's a, it's a decent product. And, uh, you know, I've been, a bit, I've been a bit hard on minis over the years because some of the mini derivatives I'm just not down with. But this just feels like a package that works priced in a way where it's like it's coming down into the real world you know there's lots of evs finally sort of around twenty thousand pounds 
You can see from this little chart here that the Mini E is round about in the middle of its rivals. The Zoe comes in at the cheapest and yet it's got the biggest battery pack and the biggest range. Uh, or does it? Because the E-Up, although it's slightly more than the Zoe, the E-Up's cousins, the Skoda Citigo and the Seat Mi, come in lower than the Zoe and they're kind of all the same car. So that's interesting. Suddenly, around £17,000 with the government grant in the UK of 3,500 quid, we've actually got some seriously affordable, small, useful EVs finally. We've got the E-Up, we've got the, the Citigo and the Seat Mi, and we've got the Zoe. This is in the middle, and then you've got the Honda E way out there is the most expensive, and just behind it, the E208 Peugeot. It depends what your preference is. Apparently, 50% of the people that have pre-ordered them have gone for the top of the range car. Because remember, Mini is a premium brand, and people aren't afraid, seemingly, of spending a lot of money on a Mini. And the Mini has a huge amount of appeal. If you like Minis, and you do typical commuting distances, you have to consider this, especially when it's been priced in such a way that it actually comes down lower than the Cooper S piston car. The other thing to consider is all Minis have got excellent residual values. And we now know in the last couple of years that EVs have got good residual value in general, largely because batteries don't degrade any way near as, as seriously as people thought. And the warranties on EVs are really high. So like the warranty on this is eight years. A lot of other cars in the class are seven or eight years or 100,000 miles, which gives peace of mind. So the Mini promises to be a pretty solid purchase if you're thinking in terms of resale. The i3 on which some of the components of this are based is a far more expensive car. It's, it's over 30,000 pounds. So I haven't actually thought of it as a direct competitor. All the other competitors are front wheel drive apart from the Honda e, remember? which is rear wheel drive. The other thing about a Mini, a modern Mini, one of these, is the interiors are very nicely appointed. I think a lot of people buy them because of this interior. It's a nice place in here, you know. The thing about Minis is, is they're a premium brand and it always feels premium inside here. Everything you touch, all the materials are very tactile, good quality. You've got a slightly different shifter for the Mini E down here on this little plinth. You've got your menu down here. So I've got a physical knob and a couple of buttons to navigate my way around this big display. Or oh, this is touchscreen. But when you're driving along, touchscreens are a nightmare. And you can tell this is good because it's been nicked off a BMW. So all the scrolling wheel and everything's quite, quite good. It does the trick. This is massive. And this has got bigger over time with minis. If you're familiar with the, the BMW mini over the last 19 years, this has got bigger and bigger. It's a little bit too big for me. And uh, I've been playing with it and I can't help, I can't help thinking that it is unnecessarily big. There's not a lot going on in there, despite the fact that's the bigger of the two available screens. I think that's 8.8 .8 inches. The head up display though, I love. In here, you've got a different dash binnacle than the other minis. This little kind of floating, lozenge shaped flat screen it's really beautiful two swinging digital needles with a speedo in the middle and that's a deer i don't want to hit that on the left hand side you've got a swinging needle which is showing you your energy usage your power usage and on the right uh, how much battery charge you've got your state of charge build quality here is just lovely honestly the seats are comfortable and supportive the materials are really, really decent, the kind of Audi levels. The toggle switches are familiar. There's some up here, there's some down there. Uh, you've got traditional dials with the digital readout for your climate control. Toggle switch in the middle to start and stop. Like I say, you've got your sport and your, your other driving modes here. It's a shame that it doesn't come with heated seats as standard. You have to get the, the, the option number two trim pack for that. Um, and you get a couple of additional safety features as well. And I'm in the, the, um, the Mini 3, and the 3 is um, the top level of trim, which comes with panoramic roof. It's like twin panoramic roof, actually. I didn't realise it was twin. Yeah, it's twin. This is top spec, so it's got leather. The mid-spec, the second tier car has got leatherette, and the entry level car has got cloth, which personally I like the best. And then you've got this armrest, which has got, I think, 
um, wireless phone charging capability there. And that can be stowed out of the way. So it's simple here with the beautiful toggle switches, but it's effective. Lots of Union Jack references. There's one in the perforations of the seats. There's one here, which is backlit on this portion of the dash. Um, and of course there's Union Jacks elsewhere, cause mini, cause British, cause owned by Germans. Your regen is there. You've got two, two stages of regen and they show up here. Number one is low energy recuperation, high energy. Now, when I put it on high, it's almost one pedal driving, as they call it, where when you roll off the throttle, it, it really, really puts the brakes on automatically. But when you're really on it in that kind of cheeky mini way, it's quite handy. Battery pack size, the Renault Zoe ZE50 just wins. 52 kilowatt hour battery pack. It's absolutely massive. It's amazing value for money. And I think they finally got the interior right. And closely followed behind that is the E208 with its 50 kilowatt hour battery pack. Everything else is in the 30s. In here, type two connector and CCS for rapid charging. 50 kilowatt rapid charge, 36 minutes, zero to 80% or 4.2 hours with your home charge box at 7.4 kilowatts. 50 kilowatts seems to be the sort of favored rapid charge rate, but there are a couple of the rivals that can charge at 100 kilowatts, which is great. And then you've got 40 kilowatts for the E-Up slash City Go slash me. There's a weight to all the controls of a Mini, which I think gives it a kind of it gives it an expensive feeling, but it gives it a, an immediate feeling of sportiness. By that, I mean the steering's got that, that little bit of weight in it. The brake pedal's got a good amount of weight in it. The throttle's actually heavier than something like a Golf, the E-Golf that I drove here in. That's my immediate reference point. And the steering is definitely harder than an E-Golf. But I like that. Okay, let's talk curb weight. Well, the heaviest car is the most expensive car with the worst range, the Honda E. The car with the lightest weight and the medium range is this, the Mini E, lightest car there. Uh, although it isn't a ground up EV like the Zoe and the Honda E, it's still a very good package. As a driver's car, I love it. I think it's fabulous. And I think that it'll be great to see whether some people who are existing Mini fanatics, and Minis are a really high repeat purchase car, so people who have had one Mini tend to buy another, tend to buy another. It'd be interesting to see if those people step inside a Mini electric, and perhaps this is their first ever electric vehicle. Or have we just gone into a church car park? Oh no, it's a proper road. I thought I was just driving into a church car park for no apparent reason. All right, I forgive you, Satnav, I forgive you. Got that low speed mandatory noise, of which the, uh, the speaker is in that front filled in grill. I started off this morning, it's been really cold all day, like two or three degrees, with um, a risk of snow, believe it or not. You might not see that. And um, fully charged, the range was showing 133 miles. I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying this a lot. I have to say, I think Mini have, Mini have got the balance right. But maybe the Mini was always supposed to have an electric motor. Because when you think about it, the Mini's always been so well balanced and poised as a hot hatch. And it's now got better weight distribution and lower centre of gravity because of the EV packaging. Min E, or Mini E, whatever you want to call it. I think they've done a really, really good job. I've enjoyed this car a lot more than I expected. It's an intense, true hot hatch, really, uh, with EV underpinnings, and it's been done to a very, very convincing level. And it's also priced really well. So what I would say is, what's my verdict? If you want pure value and you want range, I would prefer something like the Zoe ZE50 or even the E-Up. If you want intense hot hatch feeling or communicative feel, I would go for this or the Honda E. And actually, this is a better price than the Honda E, really. But I haven't actually finished because I started up in Cowley in Oxfordshire where they make the Mini, the home of Mini. 
but I finished here in Swindon and I wanted to come to Swindon because Swindon Powertrain is a company that builds this, the Swind E. So they take an old Mini and they put new electric underpinnings inside it. And that's the thing. You don't have to buy a brand new car to drive every day with zero emission. You could take an old car, an existing vehicle, and you could put 21st century EV powertrain inside it. So under the bonnet of the front there, you've got an 80 kilowatt brushless electric motor that sits really low. As a consequence, the whole car's got a lower center of gravity and it's got a much better weight distribution than the original Mini, which was already pretty good. Standard Mini suspension, standard Mini rack and pinion steering, non-servo brakes, but remember, it's got regenerative braking, so that's less stressful on the braking system itself because you're getting energy back from that to put back into those batteries which live in that big central spine in the middle. This particular car is a testbed car for Swindon Powertrain to show what is possible. Where I'm really turned on and what, what I see as being especially interesting is what's under there. Because Swindon Powertrain have used this as a guinea pig, like I said, they are going to launch a complete crate e-axle electric system that's modular in terms of states of tune that you can put in anything. So you can buy it and retrofit it in anything. And suddenly I'm captivated because I want that type of thing in another classic car. And maybe I want to do it myself. I'm not going to be driving this car in this particular video. I'm going to do that in another video. So thank you very much for watching Car Pervert. I've been Johnny Smith. If you haven't subscribed already, please click subscribe. Thank you.